Hey everyone, this is the Common Thread po- Podcast down in the Howard Thurman Center. It's uh, Friday, March 30th. I'm Amanda. My name is Tarif. My name is Greg. And we have a very special guest on with us today. We have Dr. Ruha Benjamin. Hi, Dr. Benjamin. Hi, great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. So we are going to be talking about something that has been coming up in the media a lot lately with several uh, very high-profile cases. We're going to be talking about racism. As some of you know, or hopefully all of you know, the Trayvon Martin case is ongoing. We have a pop culture phenomenon with racism over black actors in the Hunger Games right now, and uh, several other hate crimes that are going on. So what do you guys think? So, well, let's uh, give a brief summary of the Trayvon Martin All right. case for those that may not be too familiar with the details because I know there's some people, oh, wow. yeah, a lot of evidence no, and people yeah. aren't sure about. Um, so, Professor, would you like to start that off? I'll start that off okay. if you like. Um, so, back in February, a 17-year-old African-American male, his name is Trayvon Martin, was um, leaving a convenience store with, according to reports, a bag of Skittles and a bottle of iced tea. That was it. And um, a self-appointed neighborhood watchman who is Mexican-American named George Zimmerman started to pursue him. He called the police. He said he was suspicious. The police did ask Zimmerman to stop pursuing Trayvon Martin. He didn't. Uh, Some kind of scuffle happened, and he ended up shooting Trayvon fatally. And there is a lot of attention in the media right now saying that it was a case about race, that there was racial profiling going on. Apparently, there have been several break-ins in the neighborhood recently, all by young African-American males, and that when he saw Trayvon, he just assumed, and as a result, killed him, needlessly. What I find very interesting, and I've heard the phone call that Mr. Zimmerman made to the police, and... What they said was, we don't need you to do that when he was talking about pursuing him, which, which is, yes, you shouldn't be pursuing him, but I expected a more direct stop following him. It's not your job to follow him, yeah. right? When you say we don't need you to do mm-hmm. that, that doesn't Get necessarily no mean mm-hmm. no, don't follow him, right? right? It, it, and he I think her, interpreted him not uh, I think the dispatcher's exact words were, well, we don't need you to do that. Yeah, that, that's what it was. It's a little bit and, weak. Um, um, what is causing so much attention about this case is that Zimmerman has not been arrested or charged. Um, he is invoking the stand your ground law, which apparently has to do with pursuing someone if you feel threatened. No, it, it's like it's a you're allowed when when you feel threatened, you're allowed. You don't have to retreat. You, you're allowed to use deadly force mm-hmm. to protect yourself, mm-hmm. which I think that's just a law that sort of goes into gun control and. and States, particularly the South. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing they're trying to repeal, or that's one thing that's sort of holding up this whole case, mm-hmm. is that technically Zimmerman's actions were, were legal under that law. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Zimmerman's lawyers have stated that it was not about race, that he is not racist. There was supposedly a racial slur that can be heard on the 911 tape. Some people say they hear it, some people say they don't. The racial slur, according to those who do hear it, is fucking coons, mm-hmm. which is actually not something I have ever heard before as a racial slur. Have I you mean, guys? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sort of an older one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But. And I think it's beside the point whether he said it or not, whether whatever he, race he is or not. Mm-hmm. I think all the debate about what he really is and how that sort of precludes his ability to be able to do this is nonsensical because it assumes that your intent is separate from the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to figure out if he's really racist, if he really shot him because he was black. And the problem with that way of thinking about it is that you can't prove intent, right? And so for the law to prosecute him, they have to go over some, you know, very ephemeral idea of what he had in his heart or his head Mm -hmm. when the outcome is clearly one that we can agree is unjust and had a racist outcome, mm-hmm. right? And I think whether you know whether it's in this particular hate crime incident, with a lot of our policies, I think we need to focus more on outcomes. Mm-hmm. Is the outcome creating inequality? Is the outcome unjust as opposed to trying to create this idea of an intent? And I, just one correction, I don't think he's Mexican-American. I think one of his parents is Caucasian and one is yeah. from a South American country. And um, so there's a lot of sort of 
for the Hispanic American community, there's a lot of um, uh, shifts underway in terms of how they identify only in the last uh, two or three census. We have a separate uh, way that they can identify as either black or white and as Hispanic, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, you would be considered white non-Hispanic, mm -hmm. right? And so we have a category of white Hispanic, yeah. which is technically what he is, but again, uh, beside the point <laughs> because the outcome right. was clearly unjust, right? Well, that's something that I don't think is talked about a lot. I think that, and I fully admit I'm one of them, when I think of racism, I think of it as a very black versus white issue. Um, when I actually first heard about this case and I was speaking to someone about it, my first question was, oh, was this just your average mm -hmm. run-of-the-mill white supremacist? Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, a little bit surprised when, no, mm -hmm. he's not. I don't think that racism between... Other races, like minorities, mm -hmm. is something that's discussed a lot in this country. Yeah, and I mean, what's wrong with this case is that a lot of people, I remember first hearing news about it, they were like, well, is Zimmerman white or not? As mm -hmm. if it would change. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, right. he's Hispanic. Mm -hmm. All right, and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. it, a guy got shot, mm -hmm. but if it was white, then all of a sudden it's some dramatic mm -hmm. like thing that we need to finally address, mm -hmm. which is just strange. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because I, I find that the racism that occurs between different minority groups is very intense as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, even from personal experience, I grew up in a town, there were a lot of Jewish people and a lot of Latinos, and they were very racist towards African Americans. And even with Asian Americans and Indian Americans, there's, there's preconceived notions about Hispanics and black people. And mm -hmm. these are all minority groups. Mm -hmm. They're not just mm -hmm. your run-of-the-mill Caucasian who, who are you know mm -hmm. KKK or whatever people think about the traditional racist. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I found very interesting the way they handled the case was also indicative of a systemic racism. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Apparently, stand your ground works if there was if you felt your life was in danger. Mm -hmm. And the initial police report says that Zimmerman had, uh, I think it was a broken nose and, a, mm -hmm. and some blood well, from the back of his head. head. Mm -hmm. But they released the police video, I think it was a few days ago, yeah. where you see him and he is completely fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And apparently a few witnesses uh, were asked or, or pretty much told what to say, like that it was an act of self-defense. And a lot of them have come forward and said that's not what happened at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, this is a very systemic uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I racism. think, I mean, you know, pointing to the way in which law enforcement, so the law enforcement sort of um, way in which it routinely profiles. And so if you are, for example, a Latino or black cop, who is trained in that system, trained to, uh, to see threat as black or brown, you are going to pull the trigger as fast as a white cop often, mm -hmm. right? And so we had this case a few years ago. The cops just got, um, they, they just got their trial finished, right, in the last week. Sean Bell coming out of a nightclub night before he was getting married and shot 50 rounds into his car and killed him the night before he got married. Now, three, two of the cops, I believe, were black, one Latino, one white. And they just got sort of kicked, convicted and thrown off the force and various levels of penalization. But there again, you go through the training. You learn to see threat in a certain way. And so that's why I think it's important for our discussion. You know, a lot of the activism, which I have been part of as well, around we are Trayvon, right? Everyone has their thing, we are Trayvon, but we are also Zimmerman, right? Mm -hmm. the, the kind of ideas that animated Zimmerman to see threat in a certain way, we also have, have inhaled that sort of cultural oxygen as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to own up to that. We're, the, the, the idea that you know, those who oppose this as unjust are all good, mm -hmm. and those who are exactly. supporting it are all evil, that dichotomy is really false. Both of those live in us. We realize it's unjust, but many of us still hold very, very similar views when we walk down the street, where we get on an elevator, you know, who's going to pull us over. So I think that's important for us to bring into it. And that's sort of a discussion that I was having earlier this year, because even as an African-American male myself, I tend to have those thoughts. Like, mm -hmm. here, on, here on, on a college campus, I'll see another black student, and sometimes the first thought that will go through my head is, either one, oh, they're on a sports scholarship, like, oh, mm -hmm. like they can't be here for some merit-based stuff. I don't know, mm -hmm. these are just the thoughts that come through my head. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's, this, it's really just the system that's mm -hmm. sort of teaching these things, so we can't necessarily, I don't know, I would say condemn Zimmerman for these thoughts that he had, but more his actions. He has to be held responsible for his actions, mm -hmm. right? And we, at the same time, we have to recognize that the kinds of beliefs and ideas that animated him are in us too, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to try to think both systemically, as Tarif said, you know, but also think, you know, in ter terms of interpersonal racism. Mm -hmm. We all hold that, but I think sometimes the discussion stays too much on 
what people believe or don't believe yeah. as opposed to what they do and don't do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I find those issues of your internal racism to be a lot more subtle, yeah. right? Because you're ov- we are not overtly racist, at least I don't. Mm-hmm. I would hope not. <laughs> um, <laughs> but those thoughts in your head, right? Those preconceived notions that we have that you know we condition ourselves to overcome them, but we still have those mm-hmm. thoughts. How do we how do we mm-hmm. deal with that? And can can that be overcome? I mean, I think it's decided. We tend to just we throw them in the back of our minds and we don't like to talk about them. That's why we don't like to talk about race. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just a hot topic that we don't like to approach simply because mm-hmm. it evokes feelings in all of us. Mm-hmm. Even We like to think of it as something that's been solved. Racism was solved when Obama was elected president mm-hmm. or back in MLK's days, mm-hmm. back during the civil rights movement. It's not something we have to talk mm-hmm. about anymore, but it's still very mm-hmm. prevalent in our society, just in more subtle ways. Well, yeah, I think in addition to, I mean, we've talked a little bit about systemic racism in police policing police work but i think another sort of variable in this you know leading up to this tragedy is how segregated our neighborhoods are right and so this is something that's evolved over the last uh, 50 60 years especially with the gi bill and a lot of the loans that were uh, given to predominantly white americans to buy their first homes that were then passed down to their children that created more concentration in terms of race so that we're more segregated in 2012 than we were at the end of the Civil War. So what that means in terms of who we think belongs in our neighborhood and who doesn't belong is something that also animates and makes us think who's an outsider here, who's an insider. So despite the fact that Trayvon's dad lived in that neighborhood, he was conceived as an outsider and out of place. He couldn't have possibly lived here, partly because many white Americans, right, and increasingly Asian and Hispanic Americans who are much less segregated from um, you know, white neighborhoods and African Americans are, see black people in middle class and upper middle class neighborhoods as outsiders, despite the fact that they own homes. And so I think that's part of the dynamic that led up to that targeting, you know, that. And that's another thing that I I think is interesting about this case. Um, The neighborhood and the Martin family are middle class. Mm -hmm. They are not the stereotypical lower class Mm -hmm. African American family. how do you think that changes how people see it? I think it makes it something that it's even more awkward to talk about because it's sort of narrowing out all the other factors besides race. So like like you wrote in the outline, mm-hmm. one thing that they're trying to do, and I don't know who they mm-hmm. are, mm-hmm. is but uh, it's sort of sort of a demonize Trayvon's image and they're bringing mm-hmm. up like his previous mm-hmm. suspensions from school, the, the drug possession in mm-hmm. the past, which it's all here relevant mm-hmm. because this is still another human being that got gunned down for yeah. no reason. Yeah, I have a mixed sort of re- you know reaction to it because I feel like re- partly because they're middle class is what animates a lot of the national and international sort of activism. This idea that he could have been any of our kids, right? Uh-huh. And so I have a ten and eight year old, and certainly like many other parents of black children, the first thought is like, oh, so you mean you can move out of the ghetto, you can have your kids in quote unquote good schools, you can teach them how to do this and do that, and still they can get shot down walking home from the store, right? So there's an idea that he could have been any of our kids, but then my mixed reaction is that our, I feel like that same level of um, anger and frustration and uprising should pertain to any child who is gunned down in this way, right? I don't care if they are in, you know, South Central where I grew up, if they are in, you know, the Bronx, if they are in Roxbury, right? Our children are not just middle class children, right? And so part of me uh, is sort of repelled by the idea that it would take a middle class child who we can identify with to create this kind of uprising when these kind of tragedies are all too common among people who are trapped in areas of our of our cities and our countries that have been abandoned by social services, by businesses, by government. And so that sort of um, that questioning of why Trayvon, what 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 did it take, why did it take him, mm-hmm. as opposed to this list of other young people who've been gunned down in the last month, yeah, I mean, much less yeah, the last year. That's another thing. It happens all the time. But this is just one issue that's just brought about to public. And what you said about the, you know, the way that they're trying to smear his, you know, the whole angel, angelic, you know, like, as if we have to be angels to warrant justice, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the things when we think about this case in the Iraqi woman who got beaten to death in her living room, a 32-year-old mother of five American citizen 
who immigrated here in the 90s, right? And part of the, so two things about the way that we talk about these cases. One is that it's always premised, she was an American citizen who da 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 da, as if, if she was an American citizen, somehow it would have been le- okay, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Somehow it's more of a tragedy because she was American, and see, this guy was wrong, she wasn't a terror. I don't care what she, or where she was from. It doesn't reduce the, the injustice. It doesn't reduce the, the hurt of this family. And so I think that we should watch the way that we qualify and talk about certain things as warranting more or less. And the other thing about the way we talk about it is this, this phrase, isolated incident. Go look up this case about um, Shaima Aliwadi. Go look. And, and uh, police officers say, oh, we, we think it's an isolated incident. Right. Think about this. As a sociologist, at least, I don't know what that means. Like, I've been trained not to understand anything as an isolated incident. Rather, it's part of a pattern. It's part of a deeper history. It's part of a cultural pathology in this case. And so I think we also need to be aware of when we are told things are isolated when we know that they're not. Right. Right. And they've... I, I listened to a few clips of this on the news, and it's a, a po- they describe it as a possible hate crime. Mm. If, if the details of the case are the killer left a note asking her to go back to her country, terrorist. you're a terrorist. Mm. I don't understand how that's not a hate I crime. Don't that's either. not, <laughs> then. <It's right. laughs> so, yeah. Um. Now, Tarif, um, you, at least to my knowledge, are a now an American citizen, but you were not born in this country. No, I was, and I immigrated here uh, from Bangladesh. And you were raised Muslim. I was raised as a Muslim. Can you talk a little bit about what that was like, and, you know, especially post-9-11? Right. Um, you know, before 9-11, I grew up in a very uh, conservative Christian town in New Jersey. So uh, my mother, who who is a very devout, practicing, but liberal Muslim, uh, thought it was my duty to educate my classmates on the religion. So from first grade, I was talking about Ramadan to, to kids and telling them how I fasted. And so I was very attuned to that. And then I, I was in fifth grade when 9-11 happened, and it was scary. I, I avoided going to school for two days because I didn't know if I, could, if I was going to be safe going back. But I was fine, you know, upper middle class family. The racism or the prejudice that occurs isn't always overt. It's always the subtle, like, glances or, you know, it's also a lot of things I've done on my own in anticipation of someone else's racism. So I will make sure I'm dressed very clean cut when I go to the airport. I will behave extra polite uh, in situations where I may not want to, just to put other people at ease. And I feel like that is, I feel like that's my responsibility, but I understand that, um, if I don't do that, then I certainly could intimidate other people or make them feel scared. So I haven't, I've been fortunate enough not to feel the direct racism, but I've also been waiting for it and, and preparing for it. I know a lot of people that haven't had that. My family doesn't wear hijab, but I do have other extended family members that do, and they get lots of over racist comments. One of my cousins was pushed down the stairs at her school. The other one was harassed constantly, and now she can't go to that school anymore. So it happens, and um, it, it's tough. It's not easy. You know, so, uh, previous listeners have heard Tarif and I talk about the social justice retreat that several of us in the HTC took over uh, Christmas break. And, you know, we're in D.C., we're at these buildings, there's a lot of security. And even though we kind of joked about it at the time, Tarif was one of the few people who was pulled almost every time to mm-hmm. be... Uh, patted down or or run over with the wand. Yeah, and I did it with a smile on my face. You did. Because you have to. As much as I don't like being patted down, like I, I, I'm not going to give them a reason to suspect me because that's the way they're trained is to notice those types of resistances and, and take more advantage of you because they have that authority. They've been given that power. I think that, you know, the kinds of everyday ways in which you dress or speak differently... I think, you know, doing it as a matter of sort of survival and getting through, these is so much in parallel to what, you know, parents of black children have had to teach them, you know, s- you know, since we can remember, right? So in terms of how to walk into rooms, how to talk to police to avoid getting shot. And I think, you know, while it's, we talk about it in everyday terms, like you say, it's sort of nonchalantly, these are just the things that I do. I think it's, you know, part of really what's going on is that you, 
and many of these children and youth and young adults are having to take on other people's problems, right? You are having to live your life in a way that shoulders the burden of what is really not your problem, that they would stereotype you and profile you. And I think part of what's happening here, you know, in the multiracial uprising around Trayvon, white parents, you know, in California, you know, UK, German families, people all over the world putting on their hoodies and saying, you know, they're owning the problem now in some ways. And I think if we can keep this going so that it's not simply around this case, what we need is for people who are not the target of these things to own the problem so much that it's not simply about you changing your behavior to, to avoid getting profiled, but it's the way in which we see people has to fundamentally transform because it's not your problem. It's not my kid's problem, and they shouldn't have to live their whole life catering to other people's mm -hmm. false expectations, you know? And so that's something heartwarming about the, the sort of at least virtual uprising is that, you know, people all over, all different ages, I saw this old couple, white couple from Maine with their little hoodies on, <laughs> with their little, you know, really identifying with this, this parent suffering and the idea that it's not just. You know, and so it's something that we can at least be optimistic about. Now, Professor, would you mind talking about? Uh, you did a demonstration with the hoodie a, a few days ago, and and uh, I guess explain what the Million Hoodie March right. is. Right. You know, so someone uh, started this um, great idea of you know using this very simple symbol in order to bring attention to the case, right? And so actually there's a rally this Sunday, Marsh, Chap Marsh Plaza, 2 to 4. Number of faculty, students all, all over the city are coming. And so the little thing that my class decided to do on their own, um, it w was, you know, just 20, 40 people. But here we're already going to have a h hundreds of people. And I think, you know, we have to understand that it, there's two things going on. One is we're trying to raise attention around this one case to make sure that justice is served. But also I think we should really understand the hoodie movement as an act of mourning. Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, right? The idea that not only are we feel the tragedy of this case, but there's also just a general mourning that our society hasn't moved further along. You know, the idea like, damn, we're still stuck in this cycle of hate and violence that our country was founded on. And so I think, you know, some people are, are rightly sort of uh, upset, you know, or, or, or rightly um, misunderstand what the hoodies are. Oh, what is this going to do? You know, how is this going to do anything? But you have to also understand it's an expression that people are feeling sad and angry at the current moment that we're living in, right? And we have to allow people to mourn in different kinds of ways. You know, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You've mentioned a couple of times that you have two sons. Mm -hmm. And listening to the way different people talk about this mm -hmm. case, it's very interesting how they identify with mm -hmm. it. You brought up your children mm -hmm. and the fact that you have children who are African American. Yeah. Uh, I know when I was talking to my own mother, mm -hmm. who also has two sons besides me, mm -hmm. very close in age to Trayvon, mm -hmm. she started crying talking mm -hmm. about his mother leaving the room when she heard the tape of her son mm -hmm. screaming. I know that when I heard this case, I immediately thought of my own brothers and if it had been one of them. Mm -hmm. um, when I was speaking to, you know, a man who is black, he immediately brought up the racism issue. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting to me how our own, you know, experiences and backgrounds bring up the things that we identify the most with in this case. And I think we all can identify with it on some level. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you guys think? I mean my like like she sort of talk, spoke on earlier the whole my whole there there are the problems that are with it but the whole reason i identify with it is just because i feel like i can't even be myself sometimes mm -hmm. like the other day i was walking down the street i was just walking from a friend's house and uh it was cold outside so i stuffed my hands in my pocket mm -hmm. i threw my hood up mm -hmm. and i walked past the car and i just i looked like all the pictures you see mm -hmm. online like mm -hmm. i am trayvon and i was like oh my god like this is just me I, like i wasn't even thinking about that consciously mm -hmm. and then my dad called me later that day and like my dad doesn't call me that often mm -hmm. just because i'm always busy mm -hmm. and like i thought it was a big deal because he called me like three times in a row and <laughs> i picked up the phone i was like he's like uh you hear about this trayvon martin case and i was like yeah yeah i've been reading about it. he's like yeah just be careful when mm -hmm. you're walking around outside i was like mm -hmm. Oh yeah! Like wow, this is like a really big deal. Like I guess like my parents are really concerned about yeah. this. So it's really a matter of like no matter what I think about myself and no matter what I try to to uh, mm -hmm. to express about myself, it might not go through. Mm -hmm. So I really have to be conscious of the way of the way that I'm acting in public. And like I listen to a lot of hip hop music, 
and like it's just like that's my identity that's the way I like to identify but I can't necessarily recognize that because to somebody else they might not understand that and act in a way that I don't want them to act yeah I mean the what how you describe it how it rippled through your family your dad calling you multiple times how then it affected you I think it's not an exaggeration to say that this is one form of racial terrorism the kind of you know heinous act is not meant just to hurt the person Right? It wasn't just Trayvon that got killed, but the ripple effects of that violence through families everywhere that then have to now second guess where their kids are. What to, you know, they, we, no, we're nowhere near Sanford, Florida. Mm. But still, the ripple effects of that violence, parents everywhere staying up at night, calling their kids extra, worrying for your life, right, is what terrorism is meant to do. It's not meant to just strike at one thing, right? And so I think we need to understand how that's, that violence is also symbolic, right? Not just a physical violence. I'm, I'm really glad you, you said that because I'm, I'm switching over to um, that Iraqi American woman's case. Uh, the week before she was killed, they, they had a, found a threatening note on the mm -hmm. door and, and she said, you know, this is probably just kids playing a off. prank and, and she blew it off. And when I heard about that, it really traumatized me because I just think about my own mother, you mm -hmm. know. She's Absolutely. in her home. Sometimes she has to stay home alone when Absolutely. I'm not there. My father and brother aren't there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they broke into her home in, in a pretty liberal state, too. When you hear about these things, it's not as surprising when it's mm -hmm. in Florida or mm -hmm. Georgia or Texas, but now it's happening in California. Oh. and it just Southern California has the highest rate of hate groups anywhere in the country. But we don't associate it with that, yeah. Right, and and it just shows you like this isn't just limited geographically. This is everywhere. This is even here. There 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 is this racism, and and it's very frightening. Yeah, yeah. My my mother is actually Iranian. I was born in ra ra uh, in India, and so my mom lives a few miles from this area of Southern California now, right? But she lives in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, we think about the way in which the, our cross-sectional identity, where you say our different identities, partly for me as a, as a parent of black children, as someone who is part Iranian, who's grown up with, you know, not just feeling the, uh, you know, the targeting of African Americans, but also of Middle Easterners most recently, you know. Mm -hmm. I think what we really have to take away is that, you know, there was this, this, great, um, this great saying that came uh, soon after the Holocaust that says, you know, if you stay silent, when you see injustice, you will be next, right? It's that they will come for you. I'm sure you all have heard this. And so I think, you know, it doesn't matter if we identify it with personally or not. I identify it because it's an act of injustice. And who knows how that will eventually come back to me, right? So I don't think we need to have to be a parent. I don't think we need to be black. I don't think we need to look like you who looks very much like Trayvon, you know? It's like, doesn't matter the level of identity for us to get our blood boiling and to, and to want to do something about it, you know? And uh, along with the, the positive people who are, who are feeling energized and, and trying to mourn and, and make this an issue so we can have this conversation, there are those that are doing the exact opposite. It was Glenn Beck who was trying to go through and say he was suspended from school for a week. And then you had the Hunger Game controversies mm -hmm. with this movie, a huge blockbuster hit. And mm -hmm. you have people complaining that one of the characters was black and that they don't feel sympathetic for that character dying anymore because she was black. For those of you who may not be familiar with The Hunger Games, um, in the books, the character, certain characters are described as dark-skinned. Uh, they never specifically say race, but it's I think it's believed that the author intended for them to be black. In the movie adaptation, you have Rue, who plays a pretty big role. She's 12, and she becomes very close to Katniss, the main character. Um, she is played by a black actress. She is killed in the movie. Sorry, spoiler alert. I feel <laughs> terrible. But... Um, there are message boards, Facebook comments, all over the internet with people saying they don't feel bad that she's dead anymore, how could they cast a black actress, this is ridiculous, why does she have to be black, ew, mm. um, ew. I, I'm not so much shocked that people think these things, I am shocked that they are being so vocal about it. I remember a similar thing happened earlier this year when they, uh, there was like some rumors start about they're trying to get Donald Glover, Childish Gambino, to play Spider-Man in like the newest mm -hmm. Spider-Man. And everybody freaked out. Spider-Man can't be black. Oh my God, no, I will, I will boycott mm -hmm. Marvel Comics or whoever did it. Mm -hmm. Which, 
uh, one thing they bring up in that article is that idea of innocence, and they said like mm -hmm. the the character in the book is like a an innocent, sweet little mm -hmm. girl. Yes, and, gets, and they can't imagine a black killed. girl. And that, yeah, and now mm -hmm. now this black character gets innocent. Now apparently, oh, she wasn't innocent. Now mm -hmm. they tainted her. They tainted the character's image, which sort of even brings you all the way back to Trayvon's thing, Absolutely. where they're trying to spoil him. He can't be innocent if he got killed. He's black. Right. It must have been on purpose. Like he had to have done something. Yes. Which mm -hmm. this is so systemic because you would grow up and our heroes are all mm -hmm. white. They're not yeah. black. There's hardly any Middle Eastern characters. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember in Lo like the show Lost, mm -hmm. Saeed, there was a one brown character, mm -hmm. and he was always questionable. <laughs> he was always <laughs> doing something shady. Yeah, Master Bonnie just came up with a new hero, a hero <laughs> based in Westwood, Westwood, Mr. Westwood, <laughs> and he's like a superhero satire. You should go find him. And, you know, it's no wonder that kids grow up looking up to, mm -hmm. like, maybe they only have rappers to look mm -hmm. up to. And that whole industry is another uh, systemic problem yeah. because they're encouraged to make music about violence, drugs, and sex yeah. instead of, you know, something more real than yeah. or deeper than that. And so I, mean, I, I just, know, it blows my mind. So I think, you know, I, the fact, the way that you said, you know, essentially that the Hunger Game comments are are on a spectrum with Trayvon, right? Trayvon is a more, you know, um, it's a more extreme version, but it's on a spectrum. It's not qualitatively different in terms of the underlying cultural norms, the kind of symbolic violence, what it means to say that you don't care that this character dies because she's black. It's part of a same spectrum of violence, right? And I think, you know, we, if, Instead of trying to separate it completely, I think it's important for us to see it. And that, that's my biggest thing with the Trayvon Martin case is that I want people to see that it is it is on that huge mm -hmm. spectrum. It's not just an issue of like, while these are issues within it, like police violence mm -hmm. and police brutality and gun control and all those things, it's, yeah. it's a lot bigger than that. And it's not like, oh, in order to solve mm -hmm. this problem, we simply need to get Zimmerman arrested and everything's fixed. Yeah. There, there's, there's some with our society oh, that we, yeah. need to, we need to address. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you guys, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that the Trayvon Martin case, especially with the police, reminds me of Amadou Diallo from mm -hmm. way back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many others like it, too. Yeah. I mean, I think we should, you know, so one of the ways that I responded to, like, I, I appreciate the widespread, you know, uprising, and especially around the discourse that black men are, you know, particularly targeted, you know, by this form of brutality. But I also, as a woman and as someone who recognizes the gendered violence that's often racialized, I think it's important for us to always keep in mind that it's also it's not just uh, black men, you know, but it's also little girls, for example. And, and, and talk about innocence, right? And so even when it's little girls of color, a young girl who was nine, Brazania Flores, right? Um, uh, American citizens, you know, living on the Arizona, U.S.-Mexican border in Arizona, you know, Minuteman vigilantes broke into her house and killed her and her father, right? And her mother got shot as well. Um, and we have someone like Ayana Jones, a little seven-year-old in Detroit, SWAT team butts into the house and, and shoots her, and she's dead. So it's important for us, again, it's not just particular individuals, not particular groups, but it's a culture of violence that we live in, in which there's a heightened racialized threat. People feel threatened by the growing minority, majority, you know, the, the, the threats to whiteness um, that, that they're reacting against, right? So patrolling the border and killing a little seven-year-old, nine-year-old, you know, this is all part of the same sort of culture that we're living through. Speaking of gender, I want to pose a question. Um, had Trayvon Martin been female. Had he walked out of that store, she, quote unquote, she walked out of that store with, you know, the purchases, had a hoodie on, would this have happened? I think we have, we, we don't know, but we do have plenty of cases of uh, black women being shot by the police, by other vigilantes, as I just mentioned, two young girls. They may have not been targeted in the same way, right, right and chased down, but certainly the number of casualties who've been women and girls by this kind of racial, racial profiling um, is enough to say that, you know, it's not a complete, it wouldn't be completely off. Um, for us to assume that this particular individual who was patrolling his neighborhood might have seen that as a threat, but there's no way to know. There's no way to know. Yeah. And now his family is left with a whole lot of questions, and as of right now, very, well, no justice. You know, and, and 
I want justice too, and, and at, but at the end of the day, you know, that woman's not coming back, and, that, and, and Trayvon is not coming back. And, and that's the problem, isn't it? Well, um, as we're ending the near of our time, uh, Professor, would you give us the details once more for the uh, sure. that rally on Sunday? Sure. This is a student-organized rally. Um, uh, the students have asked the African American Studies program to co-sponsor it, which uh, the program has agreed to do. It's in Marsh Plaza, Sunday, April 2nd, from 2 to 4 p.m. It's an action-oriented rally, not simply about discussion and talk, but actually to get people organized to take some action around, for example, a very very similar bill to the Stand Your Ground bill in Florida is right now trying to pass through the Massachusetts legislature. So this is something that we can organize around. Uh, Senator Brewer write letters to him, as well as create um, a lot of um, uh, letters we're going to do around the Trayvon case to try to get justice. But instead of seeing it like an isolated incident, we're really trying to make the connections to what we can do right here locally. Um, in terms of these issues. And well. you guys should all make it out there if you can. I know I'll be there. Um, and thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us. I mean, this you. this is one of those heavy topics where, you know, I it is good to talk it out and, and, and get these ideas out there and have the discussion because mm -hmm. that's how you start changing people's minds or at least getting them to think more about something that is so subconscious. Yeah. I think we can't afford to be bystanders, you know, anymore. I think in many ways we've, we've all kind of been bystanders, whether it's listening, watching someone's ignorant tweet, whether it's watching someone get shot in front of your house, in the case of neighbors in Sanford. And I think that, you know, now is the time to put that bystanding aside and to really try to take action and to live our lives in a way that uh, can stop some of this future. I think one thing to sort of pull out of this is for everybody for everybody to simply think on a human level and to think for yourself. Don't let the media sort of or change or form shape your perceptions. Mm -hmm. Think on a human level. What you see on TV, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to change anytime soon. So in order to address this type of stuff, you have to start thinking for yourself and mm -hmm. realize that think everything you see from the media isn't yeah. necessarily true. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> it is scary to talk about race. It, is, it can be uncomfortable, but it is very much an ongoing discussion that needs to happen. And to our listeners, if you would like to be part of this discussion, please feel free to leave comments on our website and or also, email us. And, uh, and also come down to the Howard Thurman Center. Yeah. We, we, we have the philosophy of common ground, which is to say that everyone has something in common with each other, and, and we do facilitate these discussions at Pretty much all the time. Yeah, I mean, we're all down here all the time. Do Dr. Benjamin isn't really, but the other I three of us. I come enough. I come enough. She <laughs> does. She makes it down here. And you can come see me in my office, too, if I'm not down here. So yeah. my door's always open. Well, feel free to email us at the common thread podcast at gmail.com for comments, suggestions, topic ideas. We'll see if we ever get the Iranian Palestinian conflict podcast happening. We'll but, solve you know. it soon. It'll happen. They're It'll happen, you guys. I know you're mm -hmm. waiting with bated breath. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Benjamin. Oh, thank you for coming pleasure. on. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Mm -hmm. And this is The Common uh, Thread, the official podcast of the Howard Thurman Center. I'm Amanda Dowd. I'm Tarif Ahmed. I'm Greg. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys.